Hey everyone, so um, I'm uh, going to talk to you about WebTorrent, which is a project that I've been working on for the last few months. And um, the idea is to build a BitTorrent client in JavaScript, which is madness. <laughs> <laughs> so why would I want to do something like this? Um, the um, reason is that uh, currently um, BitTorrent is uh, kind of hard to use. And so I think if we could make a BitTorrent client that has no installation required, so no, nothing to install on your computer, and um, you could just use by visiting a website, so something as easy to use as YouTube, that it would be awesome. So um, while I was doing that, while I was building that, um, I learned a bunch of things, and I want to share a few like, lessons with you today about how, um, how I built WebTorrent, and then um, sort of like cover um, NPM, Browserify, and WebRTC, which are three of the things I used to build it. Um, but first, so um, let's talk about YouTube. So one of the things that makes YouTube so great is it's, it's really dead simple. Um, to get started, you know, you just you just click a YouTube link, and then the video starts to play. So it's it's basically, you know, zero effort, completely frictionless to use, really simple. Um, and this, unfortunately, is the state of the art of BitTorrent. <laughs> so you have a, a complicated UI, like lots of stats for nerds, like nine seeds in swarm, whatever that means, share ratio, DHT status, etc. And basically, the target audience is is like us, you and me, you know, not the average user. So it's way too complicated. So you have to like. Let's go through what you'd have to do to, to actually get started with BitTorrent. First, you have to find a, a BitTorrent client, because there are multiple choices. Then you have to download it. Then you have to like, open up the disk image. You have to install it. You're presented with a blank screen. Then you have to go to a separate website, search engine, and find what you're looking for. And a lot of the sites are sketchy, you know, full of like, porn ads and pop-ups. and like, you know, It's just the bad side of the internet. And you get to a page that looks something like this. Um, and what do I want to do? I probably want to download the movie directly, right? So I'll click on that. And I'm, turns out it was actually a trick. So I, I downloaded a random executable to my computer. Um, uh, so everybody, on a show of fingers, how many viruses do you think this file has? Six? Five? Nine? OK. <laughs> it's actually just three, but it's still pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> so if we ignore all of the bad, you know, misleading links, we'll download the torrent file, and then we have to open it up, we're presented with another dialog, do we want to, you know, do we want to start actually downloading once we click add? Of course we do, why is that even an option? Um, you know, it, then finally you get this and you have to wait uh, one day and ten hours to watch your movie. Awesome, right? Um, this is actually, you know, maybe an exaggeration, it might be a little faster if you have a better network. But still, um, this isn't good. So why do people use BitTorrent at all then? Great question. Um, it's because it has much faster downloads than a central server can provide. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a brilliant, brilliant protocol that has really efficient bandwidth utilization. Um, and it's, it's, it's just a, you know, a really great way to distribute stuff. So um, I have a really cool um, visualization that I found online of, of how the protocol actually works. It's pretty cool. So what you see here is, um, this is each of these circles represents a peer. So this is a person running a BitTorrent client on their computer. And then those two guys over there that have a little rainbow inside, they actually have the complete file in this case. And the, the different colors in there represent different pieces of the file, right? So like the yellow is like a certain you know, segment of the file. And what's going on here is um, those two people are sending the bits of the file out to the, all the other people, right? And what's interesting though is very quickly you notice like already what's happening is um, people who, you know, who just have a little bit of the file are now sharing that piece that they have with other people. So it's not just the two, the two people who have the file that are doing all of the work. Very quickly, everyone starts helping out, and everyone starts becoming an uploader, which is what makes it so efficient. Um, cool. And if you leave this running for a while, it's pretty cool. Like, it'll, um, it'll, it'll finish pretty quickly. Um, anyway, so let's go back to my presentation. OK. Cool. So, so great. BitTorrent's awesome, but we want to approach something like the user experience of YouTube. That's sort of the goal. And so we can do that by doing a few things. One is creating a streaming video playback um, and making it work in the browser so that you can just share a link to, to files, so no installation is required, and also an elegant search experience. So WebTorrent is trying to address um, all but the last one. I don't know how to do the last one yet. If you have any ideas, you should, um, you should like, do it. Um. <laughs> uh, OK. So. Uh, let's talk about how this how this might work. So we have we have BitTorrent clients that exist out there. Um, there there are a bunch, and these are you know these are like your uTorrent, your Transmission, your Azurius, whatever program you use to download uh, stuff from the BitTorrent network. And these all speak the BitTorrent protocol, and that's represented by these little orange links. 
so they can all talk to each other. And uh, we, what we want to do is we want to create a new type of client, which I'm calling a WebTorrent here. And um, you know they're obviously going to speak the BitTorrent client, so they can talk to the existing to the existing you know peers that are out there. But um, we're also going to create a third client here, which I'm calling WebTorrent.js. And what those are, those are actually um, little JavaScript files that are running inside of web pages. So those are like you know a script tag that you would add to your website. Um, you know WebTorrent.js. You would just add it to your site, and then um, you can you can um, like allow your visitors to start you know talking peer to peer downloading stuff from other visitors but unfortunately you know th those those clients can't talk to the guys over here that's all we need this these middle clients that can speak both protocols so those on the very far right are running in web browsers on random websites these are running on people's computers and the web torrent ones in the middle are are actually also installed clients you know you might make something like a node webkit app for this um, and it would speak both protocols so that's the goal of the project, um, this, this kind of architecture. So just to be clear, this is not possible, right? BitTorrent clients cannot talk to web clients, and that's because web clients can't open up random TCP and UDP connections to, to, you know, to random IP addresses and ports on the internet. That's just not secure, it's not allowed, um, and um, they can only speak WebRTC, which is this really cool peer-to-peer -peer protocol that allows web browsers to talk to each other, which I'll get into a little bit more later. So these middle nodes are really important here. They bridge the two, the two networks together. So um, this is what version one of the application looks like. It's kind of a clone of, of transmission. It's, it's built as a Chrome app. And I'm um, working to, like, toward making a version two that looks more like YouTube. Um, and I've recently gotten some help from an awesome open source contributor named uh, Travis Fisher, who's been helping out with this um, using Node WebKit and Angular, um, which is awesome. Um, so, so yeah, this is the plan. So three steps. First, we need to build an awesome JavaScript client for, for desktops. Then we need to um, take that code base and using the same code that we wrote, we want to make it run in the browser as well. So once we've written a module that can speak the BitTorrent protocol, we don't want to have to write it again for the browser. We want to write JavaScript so we can run it on the desktop and on, on, um, in the browser. Um, and then lastly, we need to use WebRTC for the peer-to-peer -peer connections because um, you know, browsers aren't allowed to, to open up um, random like sockets to random um, places on the internet that's not secure. And um, fortunately, we have awesome tools for this. We have these three tools, NPM, browser find, Web, WebRTC, to help us accomplish these goals. So first, let's talk about NPM. So um, this is what we want to build. Um, we want to have these three kind of targets. Um, the Chrome app is kind of, I'm not really working on that anymore, but I built a Chrome app version of this. And that's sort of been superseded by the, by the middle um, desktop app for you know, Windows, OS X, and Linux. And then what's, what's in red hasn't been implemented yet. And these are all backed by a oh, you know, huge bunch of, of NPM modules that I've, I've written. And the advantage of writing, um, writing your code this way is that other projects can utilize um, you know, your, your sub-modules. So I'll give you an example. Um, those two modules in the middle there at the bottom, BitTorrent Tracker and BitTorrent DHT. So those are two modules for allowing you to discover peers, so other people who have the, the particular content you're interested in. So tra the tracker one lets you talk to tracker servers that are out there, and the DHT one lets you discover peers through this distributed hash table system that the, that the BitTorrent community has come up with. And since I wrote those, other projects that are trying to build BitTorrent clients in JavaScript, because yes, there are other crazy people out there that are trying to do the same thing, um, ha are actually using those same modules. So we're working together on them, which is awesome, which means once the problem is solved once, you know, we don't have different teams solving it differently, which is great. Um, and um, what else can I point out about this? So um, uh, let's see. So, so yeah, you'll see like the, um, the a lot, like, like some of these modules are going to be shared by the WebTorrent code. And anyway, th this isn't too important. But the point is that like you, like so you should split up your programs into lots of lots of little modules because it's a really great way to share to share. Um, code with other people and to reduce the you know, amount of effort you have to put into your application. And this is really like the node way. Um, this is a great GIF I found on, on Tumblr. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so, so the idea is you know, do one thing well and compose larger units out of smaller independent units of functionality. And there's a great, great quote I, I love about this that, uh, that Substack said, um, when applications are done well, they are just really the application-specific brackish residue that can't be so easily abstracted away. 
all the nice reusable components sublimate away onto GitHub and NPM, where everybody can collaborate to advance the commons. So you're, yes, right? Awesome. Let's give Sostack applause. He really deserves it. Um, because he has over 350 modules on NPM. So you're probably using his code, whether you know it or not. Um, yeah, so, so the idea is your application should just be kind of like this really specific, like, you know, ugly glue code, and everything else should just be beautiful modules that everyone else can use. And um, this is how many modules he has. <laughs> so he, he's a really impressive dude. Um, I've been trying to write a lot of modules to split all, out all this BitTorrent functionality, so I have like about 40 right now. Um, but I think like what's, what's interesting is that um, most programming communities, um, like in most other programming communities, like Java and Ruby and stuff, people might go their entire careers without ever publishing um, you know, some piece of reusable code for their peers to use. But in, in like Node, Node land, pretty much like, like everyone publishes like at least one module. It's really easy. You just type npm publish, enter, and then you're done. You've published your code. It's, it's so awesome. So I recommend to try it if you haven't yet. There's um, so many modules, and because of this philosophy, it's grown really fast. Um, I was really happy that Jacob was, was, uh, was you know, speaking the, the graces of NPM. Um, there, are, there are lots of crazy stuff on there. Um, so Node wasn't actually the first to come up with this idea. There, there's, um, you know, Unix, Unix thought of this. Um, and the idea is to write little, little independent programs that are each useful on their own, but then to, to um, kind of tie them together with these pipe characters. Um, they kind of look like duct tape. And that's because they actually are duct tape. They're literally duct taping two different programs together so that they, 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 you know, the output from one program goes into the input of the next program. Um, it's really cool. And Node has a similar idea. It's called Streams. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Streams because I think it's um, an interesting example of how um, you can, you can uh, write um, code as a module and make it as reusable as possible. So uh, let's use this one module called BitTorrent Protocol as an example. So this is the, one of the first ones I wrote. And all what it does is it lets you um, speak the, the binary wire protocol that you have to send on the network to the other peers. And you can do things like request pieces of a file and um, tell the peer what pieces you have and things like that. And um, as a user, you know, you, as a person who's implementing a BitTorrent client, you don't want to have to like, you know, build up these, these binary buffer things every single time you want to send a message. You want to have a nice little you know, method to do that. And so that's in this module here. But the thing is, you know, if I was writing this in like Python or something, I would probably you know, put a bunch more functionality in there. Like I would say, oh, OK, well, this probably also needs to open up some TCP sockets to the network and you know, do all this other stuff. And, but the way I wrote this is it actually doesn't assume anything about your transport. It's just a stream, which means that you know, it takes data in and it uh, emits data out. And the data it takes in is the data that the, that the peer is sending to you. right? And then um, as, the, as the peer sends you data, this, will, um, this object will actually, um, so that's the data that the peer is sending. And then it's also, you know, you're going to be sending data to them out. And as the data from the peer comes in, this, um, the instance of this object that you create will actually emit events. It will say, oh, the peer just sent you a handshake. Or, oh, the peer is requesting a piece. And similarly, you can call methods on this object, and it will emit the correct data to the, to the out, outside of the stream. So you don't have to understand anything about what's going on inside. And what's really cool is that you can hook this up to anything. So um, in the example of like a traditional BitTorrent client, you would hook this up to a TCP socket, which is the, which is the other peer on the other end. And um, you know, then you would just get events from this, and you would call methods on this. And now you're, now you're speaking the BitTorrent protocol in, in, like, you know, in a couple lines of code. But what's cool is you can replace this with anything. You can put WebRTC there and talk to, some, talk to a web browser. whatever events we're interested in. So we're going to listen to the handshake here. And when we get a handshake, we get the, um, the hash of the file the user's interested in, and we get their peer ID. Um, and then we can handle it however we want. 
So in this case, we're going to handshake them back, because that's the polite thing to do. So yeah, that's, that's like an example of how you use this. Um, so NPM is awesome. I don't want to bore you guys too much. You guys probably all already like know that it's awesome. But I just wanted to make sure you all <laughs> you know, know, know even more. <laughs> um, so back to WebTorrent. Um, um, OK, so what I want to talk about now is, um, Does it sound terrible? is um, Browserify. Yeah. So yeah, Browserify Suite. So um, show of hands, how many of you guys are, know what Browserify is or have used it? OK. So about half, I'd say. Um, I don't want to. So I don't want to um, bore the half that knows what it is. But um, I'll briefly go over what it is because it's um, heavily used by um, WebTorrent. So the basic idea is you want to be able to use all these great modules that are on npm that people have published, and you want to be able to use them in the browser. And so all what it does is it just lets you require modules and like write a program as if it was a Node program. And then right before you ship your app, you just run this one terminal command, browserify, and you give it um, the um, file of the entry point JavaScript file to your application. And it will just follow every single require, follow the whole tree of requires, and it will compile everything into one big file. And then you can ship that. Um, you can serve that from your website with a script tag. Um, and so you can write your application as if it was a node application, but it's actually you know, a browser, browser app, which is really sweet. So as an example, here's like a foo file that has some that just exports a single function that adds two, yeah. and then a bar file that uh, exports a function that multiplies your number by 10. And then if you have another file, main, that requires both of those, you can call, um, you can use them like that, and um, we'll print out what you expect. Um, and the way you bundle it up is you run browserify on the main file, and then you use the, this little arrow character to say, I'll put it to this file. Just kind of. Uh huh. One sec. What's going on? We're going to fix all of you. Oh. Apologies. Do I need to repeat anything? I'm not going to repeat anything. All right, OK. Cool. <laughs> all right. So, um, so yeah, so anyway, then you have this, this cool script tag. You can just use it on your site. It's really, really nice. Now, um, one, one problem um, that, that we need to solve is, um, one, thing that, the one, one problem that Browserify actually solves is what happens if you're acquiring, um, uh, if your, your NPM modules assume that they're running in Node. Like they use some, some functionality that's unique to Node that the browser doesn't have. So if you require like a buffer, um, buff, the buffer is a, you know, it's like a uint 8 array. But it's, um, old, but it's in Node, and the two specs kind of developed at the same time, so they're different. And this only lives in Node. And similarly, stream doesn't exist in the browser either. So what Browserify does in this case is it sees that you've required this thing that Node provides normally, and it subs in its own implementation for those. So you, you're, you're, you know, modules that, are, that were written completely assuming you know, they're going to run in Node might actually still work in the browser, and oftentimes they do. It's really awesome. So even in that case, you're good. But there are some cases that it can't handle. So if you require like net or dgram, which is TCP and UDP, what can it do? Like there's no way to, to, to sub in an equivalent. You can't really do WebRTC even because it's, it's such a different model uh, of, of connecting. And we'll talk about it in a sec, so you'll see, you'll see how different it is. So in that case, it just does nothing. It just, says, it just gives an empty object back, and it says, you're trying to do something you can't do. Sorry. Um, and then one other cool thing that it can do is, um, so if you were to um, browserify some code and you were going to be running it in like a, as like a Chrome app or something, which I was doing for a while, um, then you could say, anytime the user requires the net module, you could say, please sub in this other thing that implements the same interface. But underneath the hood, we'll call the Chrome the Chrome socket APIs. So Chrome does allow you to do this. You have permission to open up sockets and stuff because the user has to like, approve the app to be installed. And so in that case, you can, you can use these two modules that I wrote, which implement the same APIs. So even modules that were written assuming they could open up TCP sockets or UDP sockets will work in Chrome if you just add this little configuration to your, to your package JSON, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah. So oh yeah, great keynote, excessive animation. That's nice. Um, <laughs> Cool. So, um, yeah. So that's that's Browserify. Awesome. Lastly, um, let's talk about WebRTC. So this is like the most important part to tie all this all together. 
so we have a nice JavaScript BitTorrent client now. Um, it can, you know, it was written as a bunch of nice NPM modules, but um, and, and we used Browserify to make it run in the browser, but we can't do some things that the browser, you know, we can't open up sockets. The browser doesn't let us do that. So what we use to solve that problem is WebRTC. Um, I'm going to skip this. Um, okay, so what is WebRTC? So WebRTC, so tr so tr basically traditionally. Uh, applications have been built like this. So if you want a user to be able to talk to another user on your website, you would have the user talk to your server, and then your server would relay the message to the other user. So this is how Facebook chat works, right? You're not actually directly talking to the other person. All the messages are going to Facebook. Facebook keeps a copy, and then they send it to the other person. They also send a copy of the NSA. Um, <laughs> so basically, we want to be able to actually connect one browser directly to the other browser. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a different architecture. It's uh, fundamentally different. And the way we do that is WebRTC. So it's, um, it, it manages to solve the security, the same origin policy, and the like, you know, user prompt problems. Uh, and it just works. So uh, most of the time, it just works. <laughs> so what it is is it's, it's a protocol. Uh, so it's a wire protocol. And there's also a JavaScript API that you use. And it lets you establish peer-to-peer -peer connections. So it's a web standard, so it's built into a lot of browsers. Um, it has special support for video and audio. Um, and you can also send arbitrary data, so text and, and binary data as well. And um, it's, it's pretty huge. It, uh, you know, it allows you to send data client to client instead of server to client. Um, and it really makes the web a lot more powerful and you know, brings real-time communication to the web platform. It's really like one of the last few things that the web, you know, that the web can't, you know, wasn't able to do, and the native like operating systems were able to do. Um, so you can actually, you know, s suddenly now, you know, now you can. It, it's feasible for any one of us to build something like Skype because your server costs are close to zero, and a lot of the complexity of figuring out how to establish these peer-to-peer -peer connections is actually handled by the API for you. Um, so with with zero server cost and with or with low server cost. Um, you can build video chat functionality into your application. It's suddenly like a feature that you can add um, everywhere. And so what some people have done is they've actually built like Skype replacements. So this, um, this is a really cool site here, talkie.io. It's um, really sweet. So you just visit talkie.io, and then you, um, you say you want to start a, a chat. It gives you a URL, and you send the URL to your friend. When they hit the URL, you're in a video chat. So their face just shows up, and you start to talk. It's, it's beautiful. You don't have to have an account. It's just awesome. And the way it actually does it is the, um, the, the uh, I don't know if you can see the URL uh, in there. Basically, it's talkie.io slash some string. And the, whoever is on that same page as you will just be in the same room as you. So you can be like talkie.io slash like JSLA. And everyone who visits that will be talking to each other. Um, it's, it's really simple. So I encourage you to check that out. There's no installation. And it works in Chrome, Firefox, and Opera right now. And IE. Uh, it's interesting. So I, so Microsoft for a while had their own competing kind of different standard to do the same thing that they were trying to promote, um, and uh, I think I think that uh, <laughs> yeah, why would they do that, right? Like that's. <laughs> but I think that it's actually not the worst thing. I think that you can sh you can probably write a shim layer that makes the two work together just fine. Um, it's not so. It's not the worst thing. I think like. You know, it, you'll be able to eventually. This will be all abstracted away, and you won't have to think about it. But it's cool that they're going to at least, you know, they're going to implement it. And the only browser we haven't heard from yet is Safari. So the, you know, I, I don't know, I don't really know what the status of that is. Um, and it works on a lot of different, you know, devices. So Chrome, mobile Chrome, so Chrome on Android has support for WebRTC already, as does Firefox uh, on Android. So um, you know, already like a billion devices out there support WebRTC. <laughs> You know, just count, count, I counted every phone. I went to all the owners and I confirmed that it worked. So, uh, and, and this is kind of cool. This is a video chat between um, Chrome and Firefox. This was the very first cross-browser video chat between a developer, uh, a Firefox developer, and a Chrome developer. So it's it's a historic moment. <laughs> it actually is really historic because um, the this is the first time that browsers have had to interoperate on this uh, this deep of a level. So in the past, if a, if a web spec came out and it said, this is how you're going to do CSS, and a browser did it differently, then like, so what? Like, you know, your site will look a little different in that browser. It's not the end of the world. In this case, if they don't do it exactly right, then the browsers won't be able to talk to each other. And as more browsers start adding WebRTC support, the matrix of different combinations of browsers that can connect to each other grows you know, and uh, explodes. So 
yeah, they're really having to collaborate on a much deeper level. I think it's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, so WebRTC has video and it has data. Um, and obviously for WebTorrent, we're using the data part um, because we need to be able to send whatever data we want. We're not like doing video chats here. So uh, as I mentioned, you can do text or binary data. You can also do reliable or unreliable transport. So um, under the hood, it's all UDP packets. But um, if you specify that you want a reliable data channel, then it will resend when transmission fails and will automatically resend for you. You also get encryption out of the box. So um, all your, you know, all the, the link at the link level, it's um, encrypted. And the API is really simple. Once the, the data channel has been opened, it's as simple to use as a WebSocket. So um, this is the ugly part. This is how, how, you, this is how you actually establish the connection. Um, I don't want to um, go too much into the specifics of the code. I'm going to show an architectural kind of high level diagram of how this all works. But basically, we're creating a con pure connection. We're sending an offer uh, to the other person. And then we get back a response. And then we, um, th then we say we want to create a data channel. And then this is the easy part. You just say send, and you pass in the string or the, or the, um, or the um, binary, like the binary array that you want to send. And then the other person just gets a message event that says that the data arrived. So it's really simple, um, you know, just like a WebSocket. Uh, what is this? Oh, this is, this is um, showing how to create. Uh, so the first one I was showing was how to create a reliable channel. And then this is how to create an unreliable channel. So you can say, don't order my packets, please, and don't ever retransmit for me. And then it, and you basically create UDP, you know, UDP semantics by passing in those options. So um, you can do lots of things with this, uh, games, CDNs, uh, file sharing, replicated databases, um, maybe more crazy things. Um, uh, and um, one, one cool example that's using this right now is um, Banana Bread, which is a Mozilla um, demo of a first-person shooter that they built. And it uses data channel for the, um, for the multiplayer, which is kind of cool. Another um, cool use that I've seen for it is, um, and you guys, you guys are probably going to use this after I, I, bring, I mention it because it's really cool, um, is uh, this problem of like getting a file to somebody who's in the same room as you. Like your laptops are right next to each other, and it's like, I just want to give you this file. How do I give you this file? If we don't have a USB stick, I don't want to like upload it to Dropbox because it's a gigabyte, and we're going to have to wait for it to fully upload because they don't know what streams are at Dropbox, I guess. Um, and then <laughs> uh, what else? Um, you can yeah, right? So, so anyway, the, the solution is to use ShareFest. So ShareFest is just a WebRTC uh, application. It's a website. You just type in sharefest.me. You drop a file in the browser. It creates a unique URL. Um, and then the, your friend types in that URL. And what happens is the peer, the, your two browsers will directly connect to each other. And if you're on a NAT, like a, like a local like a LAN or something, um, you're, you're actually, your connection will go directly um, over, like just over the NAT. You're not even going out to the public internet. So it's super fast, right? It's just going over the local network. And um, you know, the, the, um, the server never sees your data. The server, their website is just there to help you, to help the two browsers establish the initial communication to each other. So they don't see your data at all. It's really awesome. It's secure and it's, and it's faster than Dropbox. Um, it was a little buggy. I tried to do a live demo one time of sending a cat from a cat picture from from Chrome to Firefox, and when the cat came out on the other side, it had like blue bars through its neck, and like it was all messed up. So <laughs> hopefully they they fixed that uh, by now. <laughs> There's maybe a little data corruption, so do a checksum or something. Um, but it, it it's probably a bug in their code and not it, not a WebRTC bug. I hope. Anyway. Um, uh, okay, another another cool use is um, this this thing uh, I, I started as a company a while ago called uh, Pure CDN. So I, I started this about a, maybe a year ago um, to uh, basically sh it was, it's kind of like distributed browser cache sharing. So you add a script to your page and then it uh, it serves all the uh, static resources on your site from other users who have recently visited that same page and still have that tab open. And so they still have the resources in their in their browser. And what it'll do is it'll 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 hook you up with the people who have those resources. And then um, instead of the instead of your server actually serving the content, the other person will serve it. So it, you're basically offloading the work to your visitors, and it's save, you save you save on you know on all your bandwidth costs um, up to ninety percent, uh, <laughs> right? So that was the idea, um, and it, you know it was it was it was working out um, pretty well. It worked, um, and uh, and we were actually acquired by Yahoo. So I work at Yahoo now on the uh, on the video team. So uh, um, yeah, so. 
how do peers find each other? That's something we need to talk about. So for for all these all these uh, different examples I've given, peer CDN, the game, um, the 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 sort of the Facebook chat example, how would you actually have the peers discover each other? Um, that's a great question. And um, and WebRTC answers it by saying, up to you, figure it out on your own. And that's good. That's actually not a bad thing. That's what you want because every application is different. And um, there's you know if if WebRTC had tried to specify like this you know complicated signaling or presence protocol like XMPP or something like that, it would have been really complicated and it wouldn't have even like worked for every application. So what it says instead is, it's up to you. Um, you somehow need to let users know that there's other users out there that they can talk to. And when they want to talk to those people, then, um, then you can hook them up. You can, your server will be kind of the middleman. And they can, talk, they can initially you know, establish that they want to talk to each other. And then they can do the peer-to-peer -peer connection. So it goes into stages like that. So um, uh, peers do need to be introduced to each other before the peer-to-peer -peer connection can begin. And that's done through a process called signaling. So, during signaling, the idea is you want to learn the IP address and the port of the other peer. You want to exchange encryption keys, and then you want to do a handshake. And then you can start to send data to each other. So I'm just going to show a really quick uh, kind of diagram of how this works, because I think um, people think it's really scary, but it's not that bad. So this is what we're going for. We want a peer-to-peer -peer connection between browsers. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to call the, uh, the constructor object that kicks things off. And what, what, what happens is it um, <coughs> Um, creates an offer. So an offer is just a kind of a, think of it as a blob of, you don't really ever have to look at what the offer is. It's kind of like an opaque thing. But if you look inside it, all it is is it's, uh, it's your, um, it's uh, an encryption key for encrypting your connection. Uh, and it's uh, the a list of capabilities of your browser. So like what kind of video protocols you support if you're doing a video chat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then what you do is you send it to the other person. But you have to send it through the central server first. So the other person now has your offer, and they now know what you want to do. They know you want to, they want, that you want to do a chat, or you want to do a peer-to-peer -peer connection. So they take that, and they produce an answer, which is um, kind of like a confirmation of, 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 of the fact that you want to talk, and includes a little bit of other um, of the similar data, like their capabilities. And they send it back. So now you know about each other. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, let me do that again. Cool. So, so now the browsers know about each other. Awesome. They should be able to connect, right? Uh, nope, they can't yet because of this. Routers. Routers uh, have NATs in them, and NATs make our lives difficult. So a NAT is, you know, it's a, it's a thing that sits um, typically between you and the, and the internet, and it gives you a private IP address that is kind of local to your network and that the public internet doesn't see. And this creates two problems for us. Um, and the first problem is that your browser now doesn't know what its public IP address is. It's been given an IP address that's kind of a fake IP address. It's like 192.168. It's not something that you can give to the other peer and say, please connect, me, connect to me on this IP. It's not going to work. Um, so uh, unless they're on your LAN, and that's a, that's a case I'll talk about. But in the general case, you can't give your private IP out to, the, to another peer on the internet. It won't work. Uh, and uh, another problem that it creates is when you do uh, send messages out to the public internet, the router actually uh, changes um, it changes your like the port on the message. It opens up a different port than the one that you opened on your machine for the outgoing message. And um, it also does this unfortunate thing where if someone sends data into you that's that's unexpected, then it will just drop it because it's trying to do this thing where um, you know, it has all these different people who are behind the router. And when messages come in, it doesn't know who the message is for. The only way it can know who the message is for is if you first sent a message out, and then um, a response came in on the same port that it went out on, then it knows to route it to you. But if a random message just comes in from a peer, it's going to throw it away because it doesn't know what to do with it. So there's all these problems that they create. So, um, so it's going to block all these incoming connections. Um, it's kind of like a hardware firewall. Um, in some ways. And so the solution to this is this, this a collection of hacks that people have, co have come up with over the years called STUN. It's literally like hacks that people have like, discovered. They're like, oh, if you, you know, if you do this crazy thing, send a packet and then send another packet and they can like, cross in midair and then they can like, go through at the same time. You're like, things like that, like crazy, crazy stuff. Um, then uh, things will work. 
but then it's kind of been formalized and it's like not as hacky now. Um, so, so uh, what we do is we, we add another more you know another piece to our to our architecture here. It's a stun server, and then so so now we're we're back where we were before. We have we have our offer and our answer. Um, so now what we do is we we create um, what's called a well first okay so first we're going to solve the problem of finding out what our IP address is. So we send a message to the stun server, and since it's sitting out on the public internet, it can see what our real IP is, right? Mm -hmm. So it it tells us it responds with our real IP and the port that was opened by the router. So now we know that great. And that thing is called an ICE candidate. Uh, and then the other person does the same thing. So now there's an ICE candidate over there. And then we want to send the ICE candidate uh, across, and the other guy is going to do the same thing. So now we know about um, you know, the IP and the port that the other person is on. And what's cool about these ICE candidates is there can be multiple of them. So if you have mul multiple um, you know, network cards in your machine, or you, you have Wi-Fi and Ethernet, or you're on a you have a local IP and a public IP, it will send multiple of these. So the best one will be used. So that you it, it specifies a priority. So it'll try like local first, and if local doesn't work, it will try public. So you'll get the faster the faster connection if you can. And after that, you're done. Peer to peer is engaged. You know you're you're good to go. You can talk to to each other. So yeah, all this complexity, but now it's simple. Now you can just treat it like uh, you know like a WebSocket. I'm um, going to skip this, I think. Yeah, so wrapping up, um, that's uh, sort of um, the technology that, that WebTorrent is going to use to let peers talk to each other. And there's a little bit more work that needs to be done to figure out like, how the peers are going to kind of keep track of each other. And um, this is a little more complicated than with normal BitTorrent. And I haven't solved all those problems yet, but I'm working on it. And Right now, if you want to go check out WebTorrent, you can download a native app that's written in Node WebKit, and um, you can start downloading torrents, and you can start streaming video. Actually, so you can start watching the torrent, you know, start watching the video that you want before it's finished. Um, but um, but it's not quite, you know, fully finished yet. The vision isn't isn't there yet. You still can't go to a website and and use uh, and use uh, you know uh, you know peer to peer to you know to download stuff from BitTorrent. It's not there yet. Um, and the reason is we need these these streaming clients to be really good. So the, the native the Node WebKit app that I'm working on needs to be really good so that we all use it as our default BitTorrent client. And we use it to stream videos and everyone wants to use it. And then we make it talk WebTorrent. We make it talk WebRTC. And then suddenly this the you know the web users can use it, can 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 kind of bridge across the network. So that's the plan. So uh, yeah, so NPM, Browserify, WebRTC, I encourage you to check them out. They're awesome. Use them in your projects. And um, if you want to get started with WebRTC, since you know, maybe you don't want to deal with that kind of mumbo jumbo that I just showed you with the signaling and all that, um, you can use something called Simple WebRTC that will take care of it for you. It's a node module. And if you're trying to do data, um, so Simple WebRTC is for video. If you're trying to do data, then check out PeerJS. These are two, um, two other projects that uh, people have created. And if you want to check out WebTorrent, check, out, uh, check it out at webtorrent.io. And give it a shot, and please share your feedback. Thanks, guys. Happy hacking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Moreover, I, I, I felt like when I did an initial web, like WebRTC demo, I didn't have the, the signaling server at all um, set huh. up, and I, and I thought I had that working. So is the signaling server absolutely necessary, yes. and where is the stun server? The signaling server is absolutely necessary. Um, it can be running on your local machine if you're just playing around. Maybe that's what, what you were doing. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, and there's also... Um, if you use one of these libraries like PeerJS or Simple WebRTC, the ones I showed at the end, they'll actually run the signaling server for you. So you can um, you can kind of treat it like a, like it like an API of like you know that you might pay for. So it's something like Twilio or whatever. You have like an API key, and then you're using like their server to do all this stuff for you. Um, there are a lot of, of these providers out there that will do this for you. So maybe that's what you were doing. And then the Stun server. <coughs> So if you're using one of these providers, they'll also take care of the stun server for you as well. But if you're doing it yourself, the stun server is just a separate server that you run. It's really lightweight. It, it's really you could you could um, run it very cheaply. It's just answering these really small queries. And actually, Google runs one for free for the whole internet that you can just use. So if you're copying example code, a WebRTC example code, it's probably using the Google stun server already. 
um, and you could just use that in your production app, and it's it's totally fine. They're running it as a service. It's like the, it's like Google DNS kind of. Yeah, it's pro. Stun and signaling server be the same machine. They could be the same machine. Yeah, it's just that the stun stun protocol is like kind of different and. I don't know if there's like a node implementation of stun, but the main stun server that I've seen people use is some like C thing that you have to compile and it's hard, hard to get set up. But you could, you could do it on the same machine. Assuming the stun server returns a local and the remote IP address, um, assuming, I'm assuming it tries the local IP address first. Does it fail over? Is it smart enough to know, hey, I'm not listening on the local IP address? Um, so I don't think the stun server is used for finding your local IP address. It wouldn't be able to tell because it's on the public internet. So the purple server can't, the stun server can't find out your local IP. That's. Yeah, maybe I was confused of signaling if you're both on the same LAN. Uh -huh. would, you, would the stun server be used for that or would it try local first? Oh, I see what you're saying. So, um, so all this stuff is asynchronous. These are all like events firing. So I actually don't know the precise order. Like maybe the ICE candidate would be, the, your, for your local IP would be emitted very early because it, it, your browser probably already knows that, you know? Um, so maybe that could be sent over earlier. I, I don't know. Um, but I think even in the case where like that works, it's still gonna hit the stun server. There's some security reason why it needs to always do that. I don't remember quite what the reason is. Um, but. Yes, the other side will pick the faster one. I'm just guessing, but if you included in your ICE packet your local IP, the stun server could send in the response like, hey, this is your public IP, and, um, uh, and it could say, oh, and the other guy has the same public IP, so why don't you guys try talking on the local network? Right, because it can tell if you both have, are coming through the same router. Are you talking about the signaling server yeah, doing this? Yeah, the signaling server, right. Uh, yeah. Right. That's, yeah, that's true. I think that might work. I think that the browser, um, by default, will just figure that out for you. Like, it's gonna, it's gonna, if you just blindly, like, take all the ICE candidates that it generates and just send them to the other side, it will work out fine most of the time. Um, the only other thing I should mention, I guess, is there's this, there's, um, there are people who've been running, like, uh, stuff in production for a while, like running WebRTC applications in production. Specifically, the Talkie.io guys have been running their video chat service for a while, and they just wrote a blog post about how, um, like, how 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 often their peer-to-peer -peer connections are successful, like how often they see that, that it works. And there's a bunch of, I think it's something like like higher than you would expect, like five or ten percent of the time, um, the peers are unable to connect, and because like they're, maybe they're, maybe they're behind a really restrictive firewall, like a corporate firewall or something like that, or or two symmetric NATs or something like that. And in that case, um, what you need to have is a is a fallback. Um, and there's a whole other protocol for that called turn. And you can specify a turn server when you're setting up this whole this whole connection, and then it will try to fall back to that. But unfortunately, even that isn't good enough because it still uses UDP. And some firewalls will just block all UDP, and then you're still screwed. So you need to have another fallback, or just not, maybe don't even bother with turn since it's not a perfect fallback. A perfect perfect fallback might be like XHR or something. Um, it seems like you know, in, in the best the best thing you can do in that case is just give a helpful message to the user and say, "Sorry, it's probably your network's fault." Um, I think for for something like. Um, Web torrent, it's fine. You know, if two peers can't connect, who cares, right? You just talk to other peers. It just means you're going to have a little bit of like less connectivity between your peers, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, and maybe that's fine for your application. For a chat application, you could fall back to WebSockets or something. So yeah, it's it seems like it's that's part still being figured out right now. Yeah. Did um, chat roulette use an early version of a protocol like this? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I think that they were using. They were, I'm pretty sure they were actually. I'm 100 percent sure they were using Flash. So the Flash. Uh, had a uh, way to do something like this um, that was peer-to-peer -peer video, um, and that was something they just came up with and then put into Flash, and that was what they were using. Um, but you could totally implement Chat Roulette in this. Chat Roulette got routed through Adobe servers. Um, servers yeah, you had to use oh, the FMS server, RTMFT or something like that. It was, it, it was the FMS server was a signaling server. So they had a signaling type server. But the actual video was totally peer-to-peer, -to -peer, right? Was, yeah. Yes, OK, yeah. Uh, yeah, the video is peer-to-peer, because otherwise, I think that the students who did it were like, you know, they were just like broke students. They could not handle the load of, of naked people going through. So. Um, <laughs> I think we've got time for one more. 
Uh, go for it. Yeah, that's a good question. If you don't want to serve, yeah, it, it's kind of unfortunate, right? That we have peer to peer, we have you know the ability to decentralize, but at the end of the day, like you still have to go through a server to get it set up. Um, that's a great, great question. Um, so a few problems with going through a signaling server are your encryption key that you're, you're both agreeing on are are being seen by the server, and unfortunately, if the server is middleman is malicious, then your peer to peer connection can be um, eavesdropped on if the person can watch your network traffic because they have your secret. Um, so you're trusting the signaling server to not be bad. Um, and another problem, of course, is that you're, you're serving your JavaScript from a central server, and the JavaScript could be tampered with or something like that. But assuming that you have a good ser like a friendly server, what you could do, if you didn't want to allow any of that stuff to be seen by, OK, so let me, let me rephrase. Assuming you had a server that would serve good JavaScript initially to you, you could have secure communication if you took those, um, took the offers and the answers and the ICE candidates, and you like sent them through another channel to the other person, like you read them over the phone, or you like walked it over on a piece of paper, or you IM'd it or something, then the other person could paste that in to some field, and now you've had, you've done sort of like out of band signaling. You don't need to like give that to the middleman. That's an idea. So that's the scenario without the signaling server. Yeah, you remove the signaling server, and then actually that's a great I point. Now. I, I think that's what I did. I think I copied and pasted. Oh. The Okay, there you go, yeah. Okay. And actually, the, the, that's a good point that we brought this up. So this is actually how Web, WebTorrent is going to solve the problem of, of peers kind of, so we don't have a signaling server in WebTorrent. That would defeat the point. So the solution is peers introduce each other to other peers. So if I'm peer A and I want to talk to peer C and we're both connected to peer B, right, then I say, hey, peer B, introduce me to peer C. And then we do the signaling process using peer B as the middleman. So that's that's actually I should mention that in my I should have mentioned that glad it came up in the Q and A it's kind of important <laughs> so that's actually like the how the whole thing is gonna work <laughs> yeah so good question. <laughs> You um, could. The signaling server will have that key then, so they could read that message and still get the other key. Right. If it went through. Right. I mean, exactly. At some point, is when a key goes over the internet. Especially if you're worried about it, like an omniscient attacker, someone who has like complete network surveillance capabilities, then yeah, like they're gonna. There's Diffie Hellman key exchange. But you have to have a public. Key. You have to know the public key in advance, right? Um, you have to. That public key can be public. That's the point. Right. But for like random, uh, like you know, chat like Facebook chat users or something like that, who you're still trusting someone to give you the public key and have it be right. So you're right. If you know their public key in advance, and you get introduced by an untrusted signaling server, once you have a, a safe connection to them, then you could use that public key to 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 actually get a secure link to them. There's a lot of ifs there. <laughs> okay, I think that's uh, that's it. Give it up for Farad. Thanks.